Warm welcome once again to the High Performance Human Podcast. It's your man Andy here. I am very excited. This is going to be a freight train of value walloping down the track. Uh, Maz Farrelly is one of these human beings that, one, I'm tremendously grateful to have crossed paths with, um, but point two, pretty much everybody who crosses paths with Maz Farrelly is generally very, very grateful that they did. And now Maz is a layer, she is a human of influence of the highest order, having been in probably everybody's front room via TV. She's produced some of the biggest shows the world has ever seen. And over the course of a few years, she's obviously learned a fair few things around the topic of influence, being able to articulate your influence to others in a way that makes you truly who you are. She is an individual unlike any other, and I am absolutely delighted to have her on the show. Maz, it's a warm welcome to you. Welcome to the High Performance Human Podcast. How are you? And more importantly, where are you at the minute? Right, so number one, people are only going to be disappointed after that enormous build-up Everyone's going to listen to the girl. Well, that was disappointing. Uh, she didn't really deliver. Uh, I look like I'm in a Thai jail. I'm not. I'm in a hotel room in Bangkok. Uh, and I'm having a few days here. Tomorrow I'm having a writing day. And I have to leave my home if I'm doing any kind of writing or work. Because if I'm at home, there's always something to do that is more interesting than working. So uh, I take myself away. So today I am going out into the madness that is Bangkok and I love Bangkok so much I can't tell you uh, and then tomorrow I'm taking myself off somewhere quiet to write. So I look like I'm in jail, I'm not. If there's a sandwich vacuum cleaner it's not me just whizzing around, uh, it will be someone outside so I should explain if there are any sounds, that's what it is. Look, I think I think you can be forgiven. I really like what I mean. I know that it's uh, it's all it's very very good to take yourself away from your natural environment when I, whenever you're trying to be productive. Because for me, the pantry is enough of a distraction half the time. But um, why go to an extreme like Bangkok? Uh, so I take being creative really seriously, and for me, it's work. You know, when people say to me, "What do you do when you've got writer's block?" Uh, I say I write because it's my job. So I used to be a comedy writer and some days it'd be really hard to be funny mm. <laughs> because you're just not feeling very funny. And, you know, you're sitting in front of a blank screen and you have a deadline because you have a show and you've got to write it. So I quite like taking myself away and putting myself somewhere where I can write uh, undistracted and I, when I used to I've written a lot of uh, cooking shows bizarrely because I can't cook but I used to take myself off to shopping centres and I would sit where I could see supermarkets and see people walking around and I would just look at them and think what do you want what do you want because I want to give you something that you really want mm. that will make you happy and add value to your life it's not about me what I want to write it's about what people want to watch or mm. hear or see so I take creativity very seriously. Uh, so when I do it, uh, I like to take myself away. I like Bangkok because, A, I'm foreign here, yeah, you know, and I stand out, you know, I'm 14 feet taller than everyone, and I'm very white. I'm not just white. I'm like the whitest of white. My parents <laughs> are Irish, so I'm, I look like I've slipped in a deep freeze, you know, I'm blue. <laughs> uh, and I like that that difference makes me think you know I have to think about how the train works you know I bought a coffee before this mm. and um you know my ties I speak Thai like a two-year-old uh and I find that really interesting I pick up Thai all the time I like that I think it's very good for your brain to take yourself away from your routine and challenge your brain a little bit and that's why I really like it I like walking around and seeing things I don't normally see. I think that's very good for you. Mm. Uh, and seeing, you know, graffiti and looking at what people are wearing. And, you know, it's really, I find that really interesting and stimulating. And I like to keep my brain a bit excited. 
I think this is the word stimulating. I think it's hit the nail on the head. I love, I love that actually. And I think more people should do that. Uh, I think whenever we're in any, anything, I mean, whether as we're in as creative a role as, uh, is what Maz tends to find herself in on the regular, or if you're just in a sales role, or if you're in a business ownership and you're just not, you're just not really sure about which direction to go in next, getting yourself out of the comfort zone can certainly spark uh, your interest in other things. And I think one of the reasons why we can feel very, very uninspired is, is because we don't, we don't challenge our brain as much as what we should. And we do tend to end up and end, end up going into a bit more of a robotic sort of monotony uh, that, that is our lives from time to time. But let's crack yeah. on with this because I want to talk about influence with you. And I think this sort of segues us in wonderfully before we do, I've got to get the the standard two questions out that I need to ask you, Maz, for the benefit of our listeners. Now, for me, uh, being a high performance human is all about four elements: success, connection, influence, and happiness. I always ask all of our listeners, all of our uh, guests, and all our listeners actually, as to what they define as a high performance human. Before that, though, uh, let us hear the Genesis story. You've got one of the more interesting stories that have brought you to this point. So why don't you just give us a quick elevator pitch on that? <laughs> uh, so my background. So uh, I went to an extraordinarily posh school in London uh, that was on the site of Bedlam, the old uh, mental health institution that you read about in Dickens. And it was haunted. Uh, but that obviously didn't really influence my life. I didn't become a ghost hunter. Uh, my, I went to... Art college, journalism college, and fashion college. So technically, I'm qualified to go shopping, write about it, draw pictures. Uh, I have very few qualifications. I knew when I left school that I didn't want to do a degree. Even though I was reasonably academic, I was thoroughly bored by school. Uh, and I'm very interested in education. Uh, and I applied for a Churchill scholarship recently on how to use entertainment for education. Didn't get it, but I'm still quite passionate about it. Uh, I left school and worked on magazines and I was a stylist in London when it couldn't be more fun to be a stylist in London. <laughs> It'd be impossible for it to be more fun. Uh, so I got free tickets to everything. Uh, for a while, I uh, wrote for a magazine called ID Magazine, you might know. And uh, I used to do the kind of arts and you know parties and nightclubs uh so i was paid to go clubbing i mean it just could not be better um i did that for about 10 years absolutely uh, sorry absolutely fabulous was based on my agent uh so i lived that life and it really genuinely was like that uh you know i traveled first class stayed in beautiful hotels worked with supermodels uh, and then I applied for a job on This Morning, which is a TV show in the UK, a big morning show, very, very famous one. And uh, I got the job, which absolutely staggered me. And I had no idea how to make telly. So I called a guy that I'd kissed on my 21st birthday who uh, worked uh, for a record company uh, and said, I've got this job in telly. I don't really know what to do. And then he told me. And so that was the start of my TV career. And... Yeah, I've made really big shows. Uh, I was the first, one of the first people to see Andrew Morton's Princess Down the Book. That was kind of exciting because uh, someone had given me a little paragraph that said someone's writing a book and it will probably challenge the Constitution. Uh, and I thought, well, that sounds interesting. Booked mm -hmm. him uh, and met him. And he told me, I remember being on a plane coming back with him from London to Liverpool. And I remember him saying to me, Prince Charles is having an affair. He's been having an affair for years, all the way through the marriage. And, you know, uh, her name is Camilla. And you'll hear about this. And you'll remember this conversation. And I remember thinking, I just don't know if I believe that. Uh, cut to. <laughs> mm. <laughs> True. Uh, uh, and, yeah, I made lots of big TV shows. And I was really very blessed that I worked hard. People noticed. And I was headhunted for 20 years, never applied for a job ever. Uh, I just had people saying, would you like to come and, would you like to come and, you know, run Big Brother, run The X Factor, run The Celebrity Apprentice, run Dancing with the Stars, run whatever it is. 
uh, and I chose jobs by fun. I thought, oh, that seems like fun. So I did it. So I never had a career path. Uh, and then one day I woke up and I didn't love telly anymore. And it was like telly was lying next to me in the bed. And I just said, I don't love you. And you haven't done anything wrong, but I don't love you anymore. And I'm gone. And I now uh, speak at conferences and uh, people sometimes come up to me afterwards and say, would you come and train my people to be a bit more interesting? And that's the big thing I'm doing at the moment. Uh, and I do that. And I cannot tell you, Andy, how much I love it. I love telly, but I feel like this is my true love. And I couldn't have done it without having done all the madness of the media. Uh, and yeah, now I have the greatest job on earth and I travel the world and I love it. What from your background, because you would have worked with all sorts of different people, right? All sorts of celebrities and, you know, big and small and, and everything in between. What are you teaching people now that you either observe from back in the day, like key things, like one or two key things that, that you observe from back in the day? Or is there anything that you're teaching now that you wish you told some of these people that you were producing for and whatnot back then? Uh, I'm teaching people from everything I've learned. When you work in TV, it's very privileged. You work with the most successful people on earth. So on my TV shows, uh, I've had uh, King Charles, Donald Trump, Beyonce, Snoop Dogg, Buzz Aldrin, you know, scientists, politicians, you know, one of the first people on the moon, uh, you know, the biggest stars of the world, movie stars, you know, everybody. You sit in a room with them. You know, I've sat in a room with the most famous most interesting and most successful people on earth from every sphere of life. Mm. And I'm very curious. Uh, my friends will call it nosy. I like to call it curious because I think it's nicer. Uh, and I ask people everything about themselves. I just am really interested in people. Mm. And it's sort of chicken and egg. Did I do that job because I was fascinated by people or did I become fascinated by people? And I think probably I've always been like that. I find people really interesting. I've mm. never met anyone who didn't have a fascinating story, but most people don't tell it. And that's what I do for work. People will say, you know, well, I'm really passionate. I'm a real people person. You know, it's a game changing industry, this one. Uh, we're very authentic and it's just noise. And I help them tell the story that is fascinating because TV is essentially really boring stuff made interesting. You know, if someone, if you said to me, would you like to come around my house and watch me cook? I would rather stamp on my own eyeballs. Yeah. Uh, and yet millions of people will watch telly, uh, watching people cook or sing or dance or clean their house or go into the wild or, you know, really dull stuff. Would you like to go and watch me foraging for berries in the wild? You know, no, I would rather lose a limb, but we'll <laughs> watch it on TV because we make it fascinating. So. You know, it's it's a really strange thing. People have forgotten it's their job to be interesting, uh, but it is your job to be interesting. And I think of everything as a job. You were talking about, you know, if you're not feeling inspired. Now, I would say to all the people who aren't feeling inspired, it's your job to be inspired. Go and be inspired. Now, mm. I'm in a very privileged position. that I can get on a plane and, you know, carbon offset and, you know, take public transport when I'm here. And, you know, I can do that. I have the time and I have the money to do it. So I'm very blessed. But you can go to a, a gallery or walk in a forest or go to the beach or stand, you know, somewhere that's so crazy busy or, you know, you can do something, but it's your job to do it. It's not going to happen to you by accident. You have to go and do it and be inspired. And whatever it is you love, you know, if it's music, set time aside to listen to music but really, you know, music that really fills your soul. Mm. And it's your job to do it. It's not, it's not going to happen to you unless you do it. Uh, yeah. So I take all of that very seriously. Yeah, I love it. I love it. Now, I'd love to get your definition of a high-performance human because I have a feeling everybody's definition has been different. I think yours is going to be left of centre. I've been looking forward to having you tell me what your high performance <laughs> feels like. Um, I've got an idea as to what it could be, 
But tell, Ooh, tell me. me. And t- no, 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 no. No, you go first. You no, go no, first. No, no, no. You, you first. don't tell you me. You can change it. You might change it. You might go, no, yeah, that's exactly what I was going to say. Hey, okay, write you, it down you, and then show you me. You know me enough <laughs> now, my, by now, Maz. Like, if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. Yeah, you're not going to lie. <laughs> um, tell me, what is your definition of a high-performance human? Uh, I think I think a high-performance human is someone who has a very good soul, is ethical, kind. I think kindness is an absolute superpower that people think is a weakness. I always find that very interesting uh, because it is much easier not to be kind to your teams, uh, especially the ones who annoy you. It's much easier not to be kind. It's much harder to be very kind to them, and give them more love than you want to. Uh, I think it's setting your own goals and achieving them. And my friend Harvey and I laugh about this. We say we never disappoint ourselves because we set ourselves very, very low, a very low standard. <laughs> so, we so we're never, you know, I said to him yesterday, what are you doing? He said, um, I'm going to spend the entire day on the sofa because we'd gone out for, um, uh, we'd gone out the night before to a party. And uh, I was getting up and, you know, traveling to Bangkok. And he said, I'm going to travel to the bathroom from the sofa uh, possibly to the fridge and that will be my day and so they'll be very disappointed if I do anything else and I thought what a lovely what a lovely get out of jail free day you just go I'm just going to do this I'm just I'm not doing anything else uh, and for me that's high performance he set himself a goal if he does any more he's going to walk the dog as well uh, if he does any more than that I think he'll feel disappointed in himself and I'll feel like he's frankly let himself down so I think set yourself goals set yourself a goal it's achievable and really you don't have to be you don't have to climb to the top of the mountain if you don't want to that's not your thing you don't have to not everyone has to reach the top of the mountain not everyone wants to so I think set yourself the goal that makes you really really happy in life and do what you can to achieve it and if you don't and you want to try again try again and if you don't don't you know not everybody is a leader if everyone's a leader, nothing gets done. <laughs> Some people have to actually do work. Very true. Uh, yeah, so I think I think high performance is not about what you do. I think it's more how you do it. Yeah. That's what I think is high performance. I like people who are very kind and very ethical. I find it astounding that... People are at work any different to they are in life. I mean, if you're really ethical in life and you walk into an office, you can't leave your ethics outside the door. You have to carry them in with you. Otherwise, yeah. they're not your ethics. And I think that's very important. Uh, yeah, that's what I think high performance is. I don't think it's about get up at 4 a.m. every morning. You know, I genuinely can't bear people who do that. People who get up at 4 o'clock every morning are going to go get up at 4 o'clock every morning and I think, oh, I think I'm not going to be able to bear you. I just don't think we're going to be pals. <laughs> <laughs> oh, something in there about knowing who your tribe is as well, I reckon, probably threads through that as well. Um, I... Yeah, I think that's what makes you friends with people. You know, I'm, I've lived a lot of life, and I look at my friends and I think, why are you my friends? And I think it's because we share the same ethics, not mm. the same interests. Because I have lots of friends who aren't slightly interested in... No, my best friend has zero interest in most things I'm interested in. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I said, can I talk to you about my hair? I'd like your advice. And she said, no, I have zero interest in your hair. <laughs> <laughs> I love you. Now, my other friend, Graham, he talked about my hair for three days. He's very interested in, you know, aesthetics. Uh, so I don't think it's about interest, but I do think it's about ethics. I think that you find people in your life that share your values and they stay with you forever and you can rely on them and you can trust them and they can trust you because your values are I think everything I think it's something if I could share one thing today it would be this uh work out who you are write down your ethics and don't veer from them and when you've written them down it's a really lovely way to be able to stick to them so very often in my career I've been asked to do things that didn't fit with my ethics mm. and 
my way of getting out of it was to say, you know, I, I have written down what I will and won't do in life. And this is one of my, I won't do it. So I'm not going to. And if you'd like to get rid of me and get someone else, I'm very happy for that to happen because I think you want this to happen, but I won't do it. Uh, so I'll happily pop off and get someone else in. And every single time in my life, they've gone, no, nope, that's fine. I said, yeah, it just doesn't fit with my ethical values. And I wrote them down at the beginning of my career and I like to stick to them. So I think when you do that, it's um, it's a very lovely boundary setting. Yeah, for sure. 100%. Now, I want to talk to you about influence because you have pretty much, your, your, your job, as you say, uh, is to help people become interesting, right? You, and, and what I really want to, highlight out of your 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 opening sort of monologue there was the fact that everybody's interesting in their own way and i i i don't think there is enough attention paid to that sort of train of thought i think everybody bangs on about usp unique selling points and what makes me different and blah 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 but there's a difference between having a unique selling point and just genuinely being interesting um i think and I think the difference between the two, and I want you to chime in on this, Maz, is um, there are plenty of people that will have a similar ethos or will will have similar things to say about the way that things should work. Or, you know, for example, take coaching, training, for example. There are many ways to articulate the same thing. And that's generally how people in that sort of world tend to make their money. But there are some that, may, that are interesting in, in how they say it and some that aren't. Now... When we when we when we talk about this influence part of being a high performance human, and um, and we relate that to how you go about your day to day life, not just your business, but your day to day life. How do you sort of talk to people? Because there'll be a lot of people that'll be listening to this saying, "I'm not interesting. I'm not that interesting, man." Like I do the same shit as like hundred thousands of other people. Um, you know, my functionality in what I do is the same as everybody else. Like, how the hell can you call me interesting, right? What is your retort when someone says that to you? I believe that everything in life is a production. So everything in life is sort of like a TV show. That's what I think. I think it's your job to make it interesting. So I would say this to you, Andy Reid, my friend. Uh, when was the last time you went to a meeting and you thought, God, I wish that I wish that was a bit duller. I wish that was a bit more boring. <laughs> yes. You know, I wish someone had I wish someone had sent me that document and written it in a really dull way that I struggled through. You know, I really wish I wish I'd gone, you know, I wish they'd made less effort for that wedding and made it a really boring day. Said nobody ever. Treat yes. everything like it's your wedding. Treat everything like it's your wedding day. Think about the people who are there, the guests. List. Think about what it's going to be like when they arrive at your meeting. What's the room like? What's the music that's playing? I did a talk at Facebook a few years ago. And uh, I was sitting with the AV guy. And we were having a real laugh. And it was I was on after tea. So everyone went out to get tea and they came back in. He was playing Leonard Cohen as people were coming into the room. So I went over to him and I said, how badly do you want this to go for me? Just how badly? He went, well, I said, you're playing Leonard, Leonard Cohen. You could be playing the funeral march would be jollier than Leonard Cohen. I, you know, I respect Leonard Cohen. However, it's not setting the tone for a really fun talk, is it? So I said, could you put on some ab or some disco or something that gets people to walk into the room in a different way? Mm. And he said, you know, I'd never really thought about that. I said, well, look, play it. And people are coming in and kind of literally walking like this from, yeah. you know, walking in, sobbing. Uh, so think about it. Just think a bit harder. You can stop thinking at four or you can keep thinking till six or eight or ten. You can just keep thinking and think, how can I make it better? How can I make it better? How can I make it better? And do you, you know, research, uh, you know, the people who are coming? Do you know their coffee orders? Have you spoken to all of the assistants or to them? Uh, and are there coffees waiting there with their names on them? And, you know, this person likes a chocolate croissant, that person likes a muffin. You know, have you made a little bit of an effort to make them feel special? When mm. you meet people, have you done a bit of research into them and you know what they've done in the past and what's interesting about them that you can repeat back to them? 
how do you make people feel special? And when was the last time, Andy Reid, you thought, I wish that person made me feel less special, really. I wish they treated me badly. I mean, never. <laughs> it's kind of crazy. You know, I did um, The Celebrity Apprentice, and I cannot tell you how many times Mark Boris said to me, oh, I'll just off to a boring meeting. And I said, Mark, does it bother you that you're saying that? Like, they shouldn't be boring. Our meetings, you know, we would be laughing our heads off in the meeting and we'd have you know catch-ups about you know, just everything and then we'd start work and we set the tone you know there was nice food and everyone was on time and they were very quick meetings so I think it's your job to make things more interesting and make yourself more interesting and it takes a bit of an effort and you keep you know you can keep kicking the can down the street or you can try harder and it didn't take much effort. It's just a bit more fun. And everything in life can be a bit more fun. When I started on Big Brother, uh, one of my first days, uh, I came in and there were two guys standing in the kitchen with their arms crossed, looking at two toasters. And I said to them, are you, are you okay? And they, were, Shh. and they were absolutely just focused on these toasters. And the one on the right, bing! And uh, the guy on the right looked at the guy on the left, guy on the left gave the guy on the right 50 bucks. I said, no, please tell me no. And they said, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Every morning we come in here and we set the toasters to exactly the same, exactly the same. We put in two slices of bread that look identical. We press them down at the same time and we've got a 50 buck bet on which one comes up first. And we swap sides every morning and we, you know, and uh, I said, you know, how'd it go? You go, it's different every day just different every day and i thought <laughs> your toast making toast is dull oh it's just dull isn't it mm -hmm. you know i a friend of mine works at breville and i, I sent her a, a, a message last week saying um why aren't there glass toasters so i can see my toast being cooked so i know when to press the button so mm. it's perfect and uh, she said there'll be a reason for it i still haven't heard the reason but i would quite like to know but isn't that interesting in everything in life can be interesting if you make it interesting. Watching toast, toast, is not wildly interesting. And I'm not suggesting everyone gambles on stuff, but it just makes it a bit more interesting. Now, these two guys are really, really, really smart. One was Big Brother on Big Brother, and the other one's gone off to make I'm a Celebrity in Love Island. And they're two very, very interesting individuals. Uh, and I think life can be really fun and interesting if you pay attention. And you don't just get out of bed and go, I'll do exactly the same today. You go, no, mix it up. You know, brush your teeth with your left hand. Take a different journey to work. Try a new coffee. Speak to people. You know, love everyone in your office. Do stuff that is a bit different. Take yourself off at lunchtime and go and do something else. If you're <laughs> at home, make sure you leave the house. You know, go and look at the sun. Feel the sun on your face. You know, do something that gives you joy and makes you really happy. And when you're really, really happy, chances are you'll be lovely to everyone. And when people on my teams would come to me and go, oh, you know, X is being a nightmare. I'd say, well, what, you know, have a think about what's going on in their life. You don't know. It might be that they're having a terrible time. You know, put yourself in other people's shoes. Gosh, this sounds um, a bit evangelical. Stop talking, Maz. No, but <laughs> the, you, you're, coming, you're coming to a really uh, interesting point, which is... I hope. The influence, influence is most certainly a two-way street. And when we when we're looking at when we talk generally, when we're talking about any of this sort of stuff, is a lot of it revolves around how, and this is it's kind of how I posed the question to you, really. And I said, you know, how am I interested? How can I be interesting? Well, I think the the one of the key points that to come from what Maz just said there is that interesting or being influential is a two-way street you can think that you're being as interesting as anything right but if you're not tuning in if you're not resonating with the audience to which you are broadcasting then you're going to be as about as interesting as watching paint dry you're going to be about as influential as a bloody as a bloody dustbin it's just it's not going to work for you and i think that's a really critical point is that influence can only take place if the consumer or the target subject for your level of influence is being adhered to and, and paid attention to, right? 
Yeah, it's about your audience. So for the last 30 years, all I've thought about is my audience, which is why I would go and sit in super, uh, you know, shopping centres and look at my audience. Mm. So friends of mine would say, how can you run Big Brother in July and in August be at the ABC writing Q&A, creating Q&A? How does that work? I say because I'm not the audience of Big Brother. I don't watch it, but I made it, and I made it to the best of my ability for my audience. I mm. researched them as much as possible. And then a month later, when I was at the ABC, it was not about what I wanted to watch. It was about what people, you know, what you want to watch. So I would research the audience and I would create something I thought was interesting for them. So I think you have to think about your audience as you know, a hundred percent you have to think about your audience, not about you, it's about them all the time. It's not about what you want to say, it's about what they want to hear. It's not about what you want to make, it's about what they want to buy. You know, it's not about your service, it's about the service they want. Uh, and I think one of the things so I like to think about everything differently, and probably in the opposite way to everyone else. And I think influence, there are influencers really, there are people you want to listen to. Now, you've got to be a person that people want to listen to. You can't be a leader. I remember a bit on Celebrity Apprentice saying to Mark Boris about one of the uh, celebrities and said, oh, they, they really want to be the leader. They really want to be the leader. And Mark said, there are no leaders. There are just people other people want to follow. And very obvious, but I found that really profound. Mm. And I don't come from a business background. I come from a TV background. So all of the business cliches, they're all new to me. You know, I just didn't hear that kind of thing. I just heard Tony talk. I thought, yeah. that's really interesting. And that's how I approached being a leader. You know, I've led really big TV shows with, you know, you work on Big Brother. There's a thousand people working on that between, you know, the network and promos, and crew and audience wranglers and producers and, you know, everybody hair and makeup and, you know. Uh, really big teams and all I thought about was how can I be the nicest possible person I can be so that I make their lives easier and I make it a joy coming into work and I make them feel like they're doing a great job and that they're appreciated and I used to do uh, Maz morale boosting tours uh, where every couple of days I just go to every single department, sit down and go, on my Maz morale, bo morale boosting tour, how's your morale? Uh, and I bring tea and biscuits and, you know, I'm sure they dreaded me coming around. Uh, <laughs> but I would go and visit everyone. And I don't, I never thought of myself as particularly, you know, it was special. I just thought I was exactly the same as everyone else with a different job. Yeah. And I think approaching uh, work like that is very healthy that if you're the boss there has to be a boss uh, it's just another job yeah you know you're not special it's just another job uh, and I think when you think about your job like that it's it's great I think and I think um, being the best possible human you can be is when talk, people talk about leadership, and I talk about leadership a lot because I've led some very, very big teams in highly adrenalized and stressful situations. Yeah. Uh, and I think it really starts at home. You know, what kind of a human are you? Because uh, if you're a very lovely human, chances are you'll be very lovely at work. You know, if you're efficient at home, you'll probably be efficient at work. Parents are great. You know, parents are very organized and brilliant negotiators. Mm. Uh, you know they're very good producers kids are very good producers kids will get you to do stuff that you don't want to do suddenly you find yourself doing it you think how did that happen kids are great they're brilliant at playing you know getting what they want they really kids work the system in a way that adults don't mm. you know we've forgotten how to do it but children will produce you and so will your dog I always say this dogs are very good producers your dog will have you in the park at midnight in the rain and you think how did I get here and and my next keynote, I want it to be uh, how to be a great leader like your dog, because I think dogs are extremely clever and there's an awful lot we can learn from dogs, <laughs> I think. I could, very good I could agree more. Every time, They're very every time ethical. I'm, oh, look, man, every time I'm picking up the dog's crap in the backyard, I'm going, hold yeah. on, like, I'm picking up my dog's shit, yeah? This, like, the, 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 surely that's not how... 
Darwin envisaged evolution. Um, I'm pretty sure. No, but but dogs work the system. Uh, dogs are very uh, they're very focused on chores and the reward system. <laughs> they're very yeah. very very clever. They're very forgiving. You know, you stand in your dog's tail, it doesn't hold a grudge forever, or go, you didn't mean to do it, we're good. Yeah. Uh, not many people at work do that. They kind of go, oh, I'm really cross, you know, stood on my tail three years ago. <laughs> and go, oh, for God's sakes, I didn't mean to. You know, your dog will walk down the same path that it walked down a hundred times and it will find something new and different and a new opportunity and something interesting. And they're curious. All you know, right. they're not looking, you know, they're not staring at their feet, they're looking around going, this is incredible. You know, wow. So I think uh, there's a lot we can learn from dogs. Couldn't agree more. It's it's a very, very good point. Um, I want to talk about conscious versus subconscious influence. Now, I like, and I think, gang, we really need to marinate on this first section of this podcast because we spend so much time focusing on what we can do to influence others. But realistically, a lot of the time we try and influence them to get to an end goal that we want to achieve. Right. And that tends to be our focus when in order to be influential, we need to invoke a feeling that prompts those people to head towards whatever goal or target that you've got. Right now with this next bit, I want to talk about conscious versus subconscious influence. And the reason why I want to ask you about this Maz is because um influence is of course it's a it's both external and an internal thing um and many of us will try very very hard to consciously influence people but there will probably be a whole bunch of subconscious things that we're doing that will probably be the antithesis of what we're trying to achieve now what are your thoughts first and foremost on this whole conscious versus subconscious topic that i want to sort of throw at you uh, number one, be the best person you can be, uh, because audiences are very clever. Audiences can read situations uh, and they can read content. They may not be able to tell you what's wrong with it, but they know there's something not quite right. Mm-hmm. And we read each other very, very well. Now, I read people for a living. That was my job. So I did lots of casting. Uh, I, I interviewed probably about 15,000 people in my career, an enormous number of people. Mm. So you get good at it, you know, probably after about 5,000, you get really good. By about, you know, 10,000, you're great at it. People walk in, you'll read you'll read what they're like. Your team can read what you're like. Uh, your colleagues and your clients can read what you're like. Uh, if you're not confident, you pretend to be what kind of work. We call it leakage. You yeah. can pretend to be someone on the reality show for about a week which is why the first week of a show, it's troublesome because everyone's Mm -hmm. on their best behavior. So you have to throw in some grenades. You have to, you know, and here we are, we're going to give them a million bucks, but they don't know it. You know, or we've got twins and we're going to swap them. So you do something in the first week that is not about them. It's about how can you produce content? How can you produce content? And then they will produce themselves. They will start to be themselves. If you pretend to be someone you're not, it doesn't work. I remember sitting... Uh, there was a lot of waiting around in telly and I did The X Factor and I really liked Mel B. We were sitting in the audience uh, about 10 minutes before the audience was loaded in and about 2,000 people were going to be in this big stadium and we were sitting there and, you know, we were just chatting about the fact that in, in 10 minutes there were going to be 2,000 people in there. Okay, so what, is, what an old job we do. It's a strange job. And I said, Mel, what gives you the confidence when there are 12,000 people or 2,000 people sitting behind you, what gives you the confidence to disagree with everyone? Because disagreeing with one or two people in a room is quite brave, Mm. but disagreeing with 2,000 people, that's very brave. And she got really puzzled. And she just said, I'm just myself. She said, but that's, you've employed me to just give you my opinion and just, say what I think and that's what I do I just I just say what I think I'm just myself and I thought it was really profound I thought my god that's really interesting you're right you're just yourself and it really works and we love people who are 
themselves. Don't pretend to be anyone else. Mm. You know, we like Simon Cowell. Simon Cowell is very honest. He says what he thinks. I think that if you are, if you work on yourself and you try to be the best possible human you can be, people will pick up on that and they will like you and they will trust you and they will want to please you. In my career, I want to be the kind of boss and the kind of leader that people would want to please. And they did. And I would say to everyone, so you talk about getting people to do what they want to do, what, what you would like them to do. I wanted them to work really hard for me and I wanted the show to be number one. So I was very honest about it. I'd say, this show has to be number one. If you want it to be number three, you're on the wrong show. You know, if you don't want to make much of an effort, you won't be happy here because we want you to make a real effort. So if you are interested in this job, you've got to know that you'll be working a little bit harder and thinking a little bit harder. And if you're okay with that, that's brilliant. But if you're not okay with that, that's not good because this is where we are. Uh, and by the way, if you get this job, I don't want you to come back next year. I want you to be too good to do this job again. I'd like to promote you to the next level or you go off and you earn twice as much money somewhere else. That's my plan for you. I want you to be better, much, much better. I want you to learn so much more. And I want you to prepare for the next role. That's what I want for you in this contract. And 99.9% .9 of the people would come back and they would be in more senior roles uh, and they would earn more. In between you know, this X Factor and the next one, uh, they'd go and do a job where they would be very employable and they'd earn more. And that was really my goal. So how can I align my wants with your wants? Because you will only do what you want to do if it's good for you. Mm. So I try to point out to people, why it's great for them and it is much more exciting to be number one than number three just is more fun and you know something lovely about beating your friends that's great in tv we are such good friends all of us are such good friends that you know you can afford to be you know treat it like it's a beautiful game and you want to win this game and that's great and i think being honest about it is great. You want to be the best ex, and that's your thing. And you don't have to be unless you you know, really want to be a high performing individual. If that's what you want, then that's great. Absolutely go for it. Be really clear that that's what you want and get everyone excited about wanting to help you get there and embrace failure. Hear no as much as possible. Hearing no is brilliant. Hear no. If you're young and you're starting out in your career, hear no as much as you can. Because some people, it crushes them. I couldn't care less. I just, I've heard it so often. It's part of life. Not everyone is going to give me everything I want. I wish they did. But life is not like that. Only Disney is like that. And I don't live in Disney, unfortunately. And probably neither do you. Here, know a lot. And you become, you know, quite fine with it. You kind of, it's not going to crush me. It's just part of life. Mm. It's part of life. Things will go wrong. It's all right. So what I'm taking from that is having very, very clear parameters for what you want to achieve, not with not just for yourself internally, but making sure that those around you are very, very clear on those parameters for you know what it is that you want to achieve is obviously a huge thing when it comes to conscious influence but from a subconscious level having that absolute clarity that what you want to achieve is actually what you want to achieve and it's not just something that you feel you should achieve um, is going to provide you with a level of influence and an interest in what it is that you are heading out to go do battle with or on or or for or whatever so having a clarity around that I think is the first thing that I've that I'm taking from that the next thing I, you've mentioned this a few times um be the best human you can be. Be the best person you can be. Not easy for a lot of people, right? And here, and look, I'm look, you could argue that it is actually very, very easy to be, it's much easier to be happy than it is to be sad, which I agree with. But when you when you have a look at a number of people in in sales roles, for example, and um and you tie this whole be the best human you can be. And we're also, we're applying this to be the best human you can be to yourself as well as those around you, right? We've got to make that point. A lot of people really struggle 
to be who they are and to and to be really aligned with about and to be able to stick to the the journey and and the the dna of who they are when faced with decisions around the success component of this high performance culture that we're trying to create internally and externally what would you say to those because you would have faced a number of those decisions right where you um, whether you are producing a particular show and there would be a decision where it's a, where it's path a and, and go down a path that not necessarily goes with what you're thinking or what you're feeling or go down path b understanding that that's probably going to need lead to less ratings or whatever it is that you're being judged on right um yeah i, I want to ask have you ever gone down path a and what were the consequences of it right and when you are faced with decisions of that sort of nature, what is the process that you go through in order to validate whichever decision you've made? For all the individuals, what's on? Sometimes you should. Got it. I think that it's life. You're constantly going to be asked questions or asked to do things that you might not like very much. And I think I said earlier, you write down your ethical code and you keep to it, that you know who you are and what you will and won't do. Uh, Alison Black, my business partner, she is brilliant. When we have two choices and one's going to make us a lot more money than the other one, and I say, which one do you think we should do? And she'll always say, let's choose the kind option. Let's do whatever is really kind. And I'm not, you know, religious, but I do think that good stuff comes back to you. And I think the good stuff coming back to you is people saying, you know, they're nice, they're ethical. Uh, you know, you'll like them and you'll like working with them and they'll never do you a bad turn. And I think when that's what you're known for, it's a beautiful thing to be known for. I think it's very important. And I think you said something earlier about, you know, it's much, you know, everyone, it's, you know, not everything, you can't be happy all the time. You've got to, you know, sometimes you're sad. And I think that's part of life. And, you know, being kind to yourself and thinking not every day is going to be a red letter day. Some days are not going to be great. And that is actually just real life. And when you are very kind to yourself, you will say, you know, I feel a bit sad today. I'm going to go and do something that, you know, is going to make me feel a little bit jollier. Or you just say, today's a sad day. And if you have more of those than the happy ones, it's time to go and talk to somebody about it. And if they're just occasional, that's just life. You know, there's a, a Robbie Williams line that says something like, you've got to be in the gutter to see the stars. Yeah. Uh, and you think, yeah, sometimes you've got to be a bit sad to really appreciate how good good is. Because when it's good, it's really good. Yeah. Uh, and you can't know what good's like if it's good all the time, I think. And it's just real, you know, unless you live in Disney. Some days aren't going to be great. But see previous, when you are very kind to yourself, you will think, yeah, OK, there's, you know, I'm not a great one for resilience. I think if you don't feel great, that's OK. Mm. You know, every day you're going to feel wonderful. And, um, you know, some days I'd go into work and I felt really grumpy and I'd say to everyone, I'm really grumpy today. Just so you know, it's not you. I'm just really grumpy. And uh, it was fine because it was out in the open. I just, you know, go, I'm really sorry. I'm grumpy. I'm just not fun today. I'm just, you know, I'm not feeling fun. Uh, and everyone would be a bit kinder to me and think, yeah, it's fine. It's fine to just be like that. Be very honest about it. And actually, the moment you say, I don't feel great, I feel very grumpy, you suddenly start laughing and you kind of think, I actually feel a bit better now that I've said that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so many things to unpack in that one. I think uh, the self-awareness piece of knowing where you're at at each particular moment, I think is obviously pretty critical. And um, I, I and also what you've mentioned there about articulating where you're at as well I, to those around you, I think is actually very, very, very important as well. I always, I've, I've been saying this since, uh, since I've started on this high performance thing that um, there has to be a level of interdependence. You know, the, you can't become a high performing human by yourself. I don't think, um, I think there must be a collaboration mm -hmm. at various points. Um, 
Um, but what I like about what you said there is that your influence over others can be can can still be of a high performance as long as you articulate where you're at in each in your in each particular moment in time. I interviewed Arnold Schwarzenegger a million years ago, hmm. and he walked into the, he's the most professional person I've ever met. You know repeated your name back to you shook hands you know Maz it's a joy to meet you thank you so much for your time for interviewing me you go you're Arnold Schwarzenegger I think you know I should you know thank you for your time Arnie uh and anyway uh it was with Paula Yates on the big breakfast Paula has no concept of people being famous because she was around famous people all her life mm. so to cut a very long story short uh, I'd said to her you know we've got seven minutes with Arnie be nice you know, she said, don't worry, I know him. We're mates. Great. So he walked in and um, uh, he shook hands with everyone. I said, I think, you know, Paula, actually. She said, uh, yeah, I've been to, he, yeah, he said, she's been to my house. You know, I am, um, yeah, I know Paula. And um, Paula said, genuinely, I know this old, and then she called him a C word. And we all stopped dead. <laughs> I was like, oh my God. I'm going to have to go and open a bakery in Bathurst because this is the end of my career. And <laughs> he looked at her and the film uh, publicist looked at me like she was going to take out a gun and kill me. And I thought, oh, my God, Paula has just called Arnold Schwarzenegger the C word. <laughs> and he threw his head back and he started laughing so hard. He was sobbing, laughing, and he said, you are the only person in the world right now, Paula, who would call me the C word. <laughs> <laughs> he then went on to explain what had happened. Like I was Judge Judy and he was trying to explain it to me. You know, this is what happened and this is, and I was like, oh, you know, Mr. Schwarzenegger, I'm fine. You know, please, you don't have to explain it, what happened to me. No, I want you to know. I'm like, no, it's all you know, very traumatic. Uh, he decided the tone of the room because he was the most important person mm. in there uh, and when I say the most important person it was all set up around him you know so we're all you know if the camera person isn't working properly we don't get it if the film publicist didn't turn up you know everyone's important in the room but it was about him he mm. understood that he was the leader in that room it wasn't me I was the producer so technically it was me but it wasn't it was him and he set the tone he set the tone for the room when he started laughing we all started laughing. If he had <laughs> out, we would have all gone, oh, my God, this is... And he could have done. You know, it's not it's not very polite of her to do it. Mm. Uh, but he just laughed. Now, if you can be that kind of leader and that kind of high-performance person that can laugh at most things, you're very comfortable in your skin. It's much harder to laugh. It's much easier to take offence. You know, most celebrities would have walked out. Uh, he didn't. He laughed his head off. And he was so charming and lovely. Uh, and I said to Paula afterwards, you know what I said, be really nice to him. Could you just talk me through why you called him the C word? <laughs> not on my list of nice, you see. That's on my list of not terribly nice. And she went, oh, you know, I know him well enough. I've been to his house a thousand times. We're friends. It's fine. Uh, and she was really, really laughing as well. And she's so, you know, she was so mischievous. You could rely mm. on Paula to do the exact opposite of what you thought she'd do uh, and what you thought correct behavior was uh but i really think about that i think what should i learn from that situation and i learned that when you're the boss and you are what is considered to be the most important person in the room it trickles down from you mm. and i never ran at work i never looked stressed while well, i tried my very best not to and you know we'd be about to go on air and the head of the company would say to me you seem very relaxed we're on air in four minutes I go, i'm very relaxed we're ready you know, we've done everything. We're in a really good place. You know, I'm just going to go into the control room now. And inside, I'd be thinking, have I done everything? And I think, yeah, I have. I've done, all I've done is my best. I've done the best I can do. Now, is it perfect? No, but it's my personal best. And that's all I can give anyone is my personal best. Mm. And if that's disappointing, I don't have any more than that. That's it. I've, that's my best and full stop. <laughs> that's it. Yeah. Uh, and I think if you can go through your life thinking I've done my best uh that's all you've got and that's very kind to you and it's very kind to everyone around you uh, and I think if we think a bit more like Arne you think it's easy to take offense at everything very easy on social media to take offense at everything mm. and lash out at people but don't you know it takes as much effort 
to be mean as it does to be really kind. Be really kind. Just be kind to everyone. Why not? Why wouldn't you? And this is coming from someone, team, that uh, that has literally been at the wheel of some of the most influential programs in pop culture, in you know modern day society. Like this is coming from a person that has been rubbing shoulders with the, uh, as as she mentioned before, some of the most successful human beings uh, that have ever walked the earth, right? And and if after all of these years of dealing with all of these people and and working with all and influencing these people to go down a path of making sure that a TV show actually comes together and they don't just go do off do whatever that is they they, they want to do, um, um, to come out after all of this and just say, guys, just be kind. Then and and having that is your defining <laughs> def, is your definition of a high performance human. Kindness is a superpower, man. There's so many people that t- think so strategically about this, right? And they think to a they go to a, a more of a granular granular level. I I knew this episode was just going to do something different, and I'm really really glad it has because being kind to people. Um, and and it's ironic. I actually had a talk just last week or the week before last week, um, week before, around, and I was asked to I was asked to uh, be the closing keynote right after a two day thing, and the uh, speakers before me made everybody cry. Right, it was like one of those look into yourself type carry ons. Right, and I had this formal sort of talk business. It was going to be a little bit corporatey and all this I was going to do. And 10 minutes before I went on, I threw it in the bin and I just had a conversation around kindness, um, which was, which, and at the time, and even until now, until just now, I've gone, I've just thought, you know what, that felt a little bit wanky. I don't know if it was really my, really down the track of, of normality that I normally tend to go down. I've been seen as a bit of a Gordon Ramsay. You're so, I know. Andy, you're really kind. You're a very, very kind human. You are. It's one of the things I really like about you. <laughs> you're very, you're very kind. You're kind about everyone around you. I've never heard you say anything mean about anyone. You know what? A lovely thing. My mother died at hundred. I never heard my mother ever gossip. In you know, in ever. I never heard her say anything bad about anyone. Ever. You know, she was. She just saw the best in people. Now, what a great way to go through life because you can see the worst in everyone. Why would you mm. bother? Mm. Why would you bother living that life? Mm. Why would you do it to yourself? You know, you can. I'll tell you a very quick story and then um, I will stop talking. Uh, you know who Tony Curtis is? Yes. So for anyone who uh, hasn't heard of Tony Curtis, he was a movie star back mm. in the days when movie stars were movie stars. He worked with Marilyn Monroe. He was the lead in endless movies. He was very, 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 very famous. And he came on a show that I did in London uh, called Noel's House Party. Mm. And I'd met him on The Big Breakfast in Cannes and I'd interviewed him. And we got on really, really well. I really liked him. And uh, we had a real laugh. And I spoke to his agent. I said, I, I hear Tony's coming to London. I'd love him to do this show. And the agent came back and said, he really liked you. He'll do it. He wants to do something a bit different. I went, brilliant, me too. So the show was all about Tony Curtis. You know, it's the Tony Curtis special. And I thought, wouldn't it be funny if we dressed him up as a security guard, put him in reception, and everybody who came into the BBC was frisked by him and he went through their bags. And, you know, so we did that. We hid cameras and he went through people's bags. He was dancing with them. And then we went to the studio. You know, have you met Tony Curtis? You'd never met him. That's interesting. Have you met your big, his biggest fan? You know, how long have you been a fan and blah, blah, blah? You, you, you haven't met him. Uh, and then we played the video in, ha, 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 there's Tony, you know, he walks on. I've met you all, you know, thank you for letting me go through your handbags and, you know, for dancing with me, blah, blah, blah. Hmm. So he thought it was really good fun and it was fun. We got to the end of the show and it was towards the end of his life. And he said, can I just take a moment with you, Maz? I want to give you a little present. You know, I want to give you a gift from your uncle Tony. I went, okay. And he said, come behind the set with me. And I thought, oh, please don't let this go the wrong way. <laughs> It didn't. Spoiler alert. It's fine. And um, he put his arm around my shoulders and he said to me, what is the most important moment in your life? I said, I don't know. Maybe if I get married and have kids, I don't know. And he said, 
what do you think is the most important thing happening in the world right now? I said, to know wars, babies being born? To know. And he said, no, it's this conversation. It's the most important thing happening in the world right now. And it's the most important moment in your life. I went, oh, right, okay. He said, you don't get it, do you? I said, no, don't really. He said, <laughs> you don't have influence on anything in the world or in history except this moment. This is the most important moment in your life. Everything that's gone is gone. And he said, we might not have a future. This set might fall on us right now. We don't have a future. We only have this moment. This is the most important moment in your life. He said, I'm an old man. I've taken every drug on earth. I've slept with everyone. I've you know, lived a very full life. And he said, but this is the most important moment in my life. It's this moment right here with you right now. This is it. This is the most important moment. He said, I want you to live your life like that. It's the greatest gift I can give you. I'm an old bloke. We're probably not going to meet again. He said, you know, I'm getting on. He said, but I want to give you this gift. Enjoy this moment right now. He said, if it's raining, enjoy the rain. If you're sitting on a bus and you're stuck in traffic, enjoy it. Because this is the most important moment in your life. And it really changed the way I think about life and about how I behave and how I treat myself and the situations I'm in. And you can see the misery in everything or not. And I do think that is a real thing. I think you can see joy unless you have something clinically wrong with, you know, your your being at that point. Mm. Uh, and I hope, you know, if you have that, you get better. But I think if you're working at your your best you, you do have that choice. And I think it's a very important choice. Chris Helder wrote a really good book. I'm not big on self-help books. I love this one. I've gifted it to lots of friends. And it's called Useful Belief. What's useful to believe? Now, you can believe you're a great person or you can believe you're awful. Why would you bother? Essentially, this is the book. Why would you bother thinking you're rubbish when you can believe you're great and wonderful and a good pal? Because whatever is going to happen is going to happen. It's going to rain. And that's either a good or a bad thing. The choice is yours because it's still going to rain. And I think when you can treat your, your life a little bit like Uncle Tony, it changes your life and it makes it a really lovely one. Mm. And that is a little gift I would like to give to your listeners. What a tremendous way to bring this episode to a head. Team, as I'm sure you would all be happy to listen for another few hours with the various anecdotes and stories that Maz has got in her arsenal i'm we're gonna to have to bring this thing to an end but i am absolutely certain that we're going to be hearing more of her stories in an episode down the track but what a wonderful way to end this the you know this moment right now is the most important moment in your life whether uh with whatever that's going on in the world and whatever that's going on in your world and this is the moment that you can have influence over yourself and those around you what a great way to end this show maz farrelly I cannot thank you enough for the time that you've given us on this little podcast of ours. I appreciate it immensely. And and I and I only hope and I'm sure that we will uh, cross paths again with you on this podcast down the track. Thank you so, so much for your time. Well, thank you so much because you do have a choice of who to have on this. So thank you very much. And if anyone is still listening and even slightly interested, uh, contact me on LinkedIn. I'm Maz Speaks on LinkedIn. Maz Speaks. And um, be my pal. I like pals. Yeah, it's well worth you reaching out to her and connecting with her. Absolutely, it is. I highly recommend that you do that. And if you can't find her, uh, hit me up and I will make sure that I make that connection possible for your team. So, look, on behalf of Maz and myself, thank you so much for your time. I really, really believe that you will have got plenty of value out of this. Um, um, but as always, I do hope that you stay safe, healthy, happy and who you are and where you are and what you're doing. And I'll look forward to catching you up again on the next episode. Until then, then team, look after yourselves and we'll speak to you again soon.